Welcome to Entrepreneurs International Network, where entrepreneurs learn, network, and grow. I'm Roger Killen, the organizer. Today, Karen Chad Smith is training us on how to become confident negotiators and close 27% more deals. But first, let's get to know Karen a little bit better. Karen, I have three questions for you. Number one, what are your special talents? My special talents, <clears throat> well, other than being a bit of an explorer, uh, motorcyclist, skydiver, a few other things like that. Um, my special talent, I think, is really to distill down very complex issues, situations, circumstances down into essentials that are usable. I guess being a farmer's daughter, studying physics, watching, you know, looking out into the universe and seeing how that all comes down to E equals MC squared, and that's the shortened version of the actual large, slightly larger formula. Um, that kind of elegance and simplicity, I understand to be very powerful. And so that's part of what I see as my, as what, it, what has often been my challenge, how to simplify things down to essentials that are useful. Yes, because indeed. Because I'm a very practical person at the right. end of the day. A rare and precious talent. Number two. Uh, what is your favorite pastime or hobby? Well, these days, um, it's a little bit of an odd one, but, but the way I get my exercise, the way I spend a little bit of time with my family is actually on VR, virtual reality, um, which during COVID has been extremely useful. It's hard to go to the gym can't exactly sit around the dinner table all the time with your kids, but you can sit around this virtual um, poker table or play some mini golf. Or when I do my own exercises, I do Beat Saber. And then um, I've also had the wonderful opportunity, and it's been a, quite a journey. Um, about a year ago, our second son started to invent a VR game. So we've seen it go from Having, being excited about, wow, there are 70 people who are coming in to play the game too. Whoa, there are 2 million downloads of the beta version of the game. So it's a one year journey, but uh, anyway, so that's been, VR has become a little world that I've enjoyed, which okay. I don't know whether many people know about, but if anybody plays here, we, you know, we can we sh let me know who you are and we should meet online sometime. Third and final question, what item on your bucket list excites you the most? Oh, well, that one is, uh, I've done, over the years, I've done a bit of scuba diving. Um, and the item that's still on my bucket list that I have not yet done is to do a night dive with the mantas um, from in Kona in Hawaii. Um, I understand that it's just a very surreal one could be from Saturn and have that kind of, you know, otherworldly experience. Um, uh, and so that is definitely on my bucket list. Great. You indeed are an eclectic woman indeed. Okay, yes. participants, some messages for you. Uh, it gets awfully lonely from Karen's point of view to look at a bunch of empty black rectangles. So if you would, please uh, turn on your video, uh, come and join us uh, as a real person, as opposed to simply a name. Uh, number two, please stay muted and type any questions you've got into the chat. I will batch your questions and about every 10 minutes, Karen will answer them all. Next, you're going to be sent a link to the recording of this talk uh, about uh, nine o'clock-ish my time, Pacific time. But nevertheless, I encourage you to take notes because the very act of taking notes is going to help you absorb uh, Karen's information, often by as much as 30%. Karen, are you ready to knock our socks off with your wisdom? With great um, enthusiasm, I will share my thoughts and experiences, yes. The stage is yours. <laughs> off you go.
Well, thank you very much, everybody, for coming to join uh, Roger and uh, to invest yourself in this time. Uh, our time is one of the most, we, we all know our time is one of the most precious things that we have. And it seems to go by faster and faster. So thank you very much for joining us this evening. Now, um, I'm going to share my screen with you a lot of the time and not all of the time. And um, but mostly that's going to be to try to keep me from being too much of a fire hose of information coming your way. Now that's one of my weaknesses. I do want to share and perhaps sometimes a little too much about all the stuff that I get excited about. But let me get started with uh, at least sharing my screen with you so that you can um, see what I'm talking about. So. Negotiation, when the stakes are high and conversations are crucial, are often the very place where we clam up. Has anybody ever experienced that kind of situation? But this is, <laughs> okay, yes. Um, I'm, go I'm gonna take you through you know, some of my own stories, some of my journey, so you can see why perhaps even I've had I've spent about 20 years around the UN, but I've um, spent many years in other places. And so to get to the place where I could, um, where I, I guess I'm still in, where I could really work with people in, a, in that kind of environment, where it was nuanced, where uh, we were working to uh, change conversations, to get people on board, to get people to change their direction to negotiation is, have you ever said, I want? Have you ever said, I need? Have you ever heard anybody else say either of those things? That indicates you're right in the middle of a negotiation, no matter where you are. Um, so if you've ever engaged in international intergovernmental activist policy in, in activist in policy affairs or policy development, if you've ever negotiated a video game or VR time with your elementary children or high school teenagers, you've ever had to deal with a co-worker's offensive behavior, wanted to end a relationship, ask a friend to repay a loan, give your boss feedback about his or her behavior. Anybody done any of these things ever? had to critique a colleague's work, negotiate with a bank, a partner, or your board, ask a roommate to move out, resolve custody or visitation issues with an ex-spouse, deal with a rebellious teen. All of, these, all of these are negotiations. All of these are crucial conversations. All of these are high stakes moments that are part and parcel of life talking to a team member who isn't keeping their commitments, discussing problems or differences around sexual inti intimacy, confronting a loved one about substance abuse problems, talking to a colleague, hoarding information or resources, giving an unfavorable performance review. Any of these things are difficult conversations that require skill, clarity of mind, and some simple tools. Now, most people deal with these things in one of three ways. They usually avoid, or they're bold enough to handle, to step up to the plate and step in and handle, but often do poorly because they don't have a real plan, a real strategy, a real track to run on. And others handle it well. Now, research shows that it's the people who handle the difficult conversations, the high stakes moments that tend to be those who are successful, who end up in leadership positions. And yet there are some simple and yet powerful skills. And I'll go over the LAMP set a little bit later on. But I want to give those to you so that you can start using them today, so that you can begin to test them out, try them out, watch what happens, and then begin to hone them, your use of them for consistent and deeply satisfying outcomes. And I want to be able to help you to see a strategic path forward. And so you're, this is what we're going to be doing. Now, fast-paced, 
fire hose Aussie, you could say, because I grew up in Australia. So the content here, um, there'll be a lot of it. But I want you to put, as Roger has said, to put your questions in the chat. In the chat. Um, and everybody, I'm, I'm sure, knows where that is. And so can you just uh, let me know that everything's A-OK -okay if you put something in the chat? I right, just want to make sure that everybody's... Anybody? Can say a okay okay we, we've got we've got some life there in the chat wonderful thank you so much so this is just a bit of an introduction to when the stakes are high um, that we can have it's about how to handle crucial conversations and high stakes relationships and how to create great deals and outcomes and the key point that I want to bring your attention to and to look for in what you hear me talking about to, tonight is that you can, using this method, but the approach that I will be introducing you to tonight, get deals and outcomes that are far better than either of the counterparts or any of those involved in the negotiations could have ever dared to imagine. Now, you might wonder how I could promise this, and well, I, I guess I can't promise that you will every time, but I can absolutely promise if you utilize even the lamp, you light your lamp, and we'll get to that later on, that you will have an experience that will raise your eyebrows and surprise you with the outcomes. And that's why I dared say that you could get 27% more deals. Now the number exactly, and I can't promise you any exact number of deals, but absolutely that this approach, um, and when you simply rely on some of the core elements of it, which actually help you in the, they're easier to do when the, the tension and the stress is running, when, when you're feeling the, the tension in your hands or the blood rush to your face or run out of your face, depending on what happens to you when you, when you get uh, have, have difficult moments. That when you rely on even something as simple as the lamp, as what I say, turning on your lamp, you will be amazed at how differently the conversation and your relationship moves forward than you could have expected. And as you make this part of what you do and who you are, you'll be able to do this routinely. And it's, there are no hardball tactics. You quickly build confidence in this because you see it working. And so you don't have to avoid those crucial conversations. Sure, there are a lot of nuances to learn. There are additional scripts to learn. There, there's a lot more than what I can share with you in just one hour. Um, but and that just reminded me that I needed to set up so that I can see what I'm doing, um, give myself a timer. Um, there's far more that can be learned than in this one hour, but I promise you that what you learn here will absolutely make a difference in your life, professional and personal. Because you really, so many times, have you ever been in a, even in a conversation with a significant other? Anybody ever had a significant other? And have you ever been in the middle of a conversation and all of a sudden something happened and, and the, the whole thing went sideways? You weren't expecting it. They probably weren't expecting it, but it goes sideways. How do you navigate that? How do you get the conversation back? How do you negotiate to come to even back to where you were so that you can take it forward to where you were hoping it would go? There are some simple basics that rely on a mindset that is kind of counterintuitive which is why it takes a little bit of time and probably a lot of what I will 
will dive into tonight is to deepen your understanding of what's really going on in us when those things go sideways. And therefore, why what I'm telling you to do can work and can work powerfully. So, um, somehow that was a duplicate. Okay, so, I'm gonna dive into some of the, what I call the negotiation weeds. And again, I'm not gonna use hardball tactics to make agreements. And I know, or I suspect that many of you have a kind of a, a simple, simple concept of negotiation is getting somebody to say yes. Has anybody ever been in a, in a sales conversation or um, a situation where you know that the person is working hard to get you to say yes. Anybody ever felt? And, and what happens when you feel somebody's trying to get you to say yes? You usually pull back a little bit. You start to say, okay, so why you're trying to... There's clearly in those moments, we don't yet have a foundation of trust. People need to feel respected. People need to feel heard, perhaps more than they need to be encouraged to say yes. And we'll get, we'll get to that. So um, I'll also give you, at, uh, toward the end, just a, a layout, what I call a couple of little, kind of like what I call mini maps. And that's kind of the step-by-step simple steps, what to do um, and what, act, what to say and what to do to get uh, outcomes. So if you're somebody who says, I want to be able to win friends and influence people with confidence, but I'm not sure that I can. I maybe I'm not aggressive enough or I don't like those hardball tactics and they are the ones that seem to get the results. Um, maybe you are the one who, like I mentioned before, you can't always find the right words in, in the heat of that moment. There are some fallbacks, what I call fallbacks. And again, that's going to be the lamp. Um, do you default to silence or Sometimes, like um, like me, in some situations, I'll pull back and I'll be quiet. In other way, others, I'll be right in their face and ready to push. That tells that tells you something about one of my default um, my default habits uh, in in my life. But when the pressure is on, we each have a kind of default that we go to. And that'll usually be one of three basic defaults. And I don't have time to go into all the details of that tonight. But I just really quickly, I want to, to mention those. And that's one is um, you'll either be uh, very assertive, you'll be analytical, or you'll be accommodating. And I just want to throw those out there and we won't go into the details, but it's important when we get into those relationships that we're in to get some idea of who we're dealing with, who they are, know yourself, who I am, because sometimes to tango, and I use the, the idea of the tango dance, because as you know, um, the tango is usually kind of a very almost aggressive and there's a lot of passion and, and feelings. There's even anger and um, all kinds of energy, similar to many of the reasons why we end up needing to negotiate, because there's a lot going on. There are things going on under the surface. There are things going on in the room behind us. There are pressures being put on us by other circumstances around. And so just talking with another person is not as simple as just talking with another person. 
And when you know who your counterpart is, who you are to tango with, sometimes as the lead in this process, you'll need to be aware of yourself, of them, and be prepared to change up how you respond to them. Just putting that out there a little bit ahead of time, but. Aaron, are you um, open to a question? I am absolutely open to a question. From Sean, University of Alberta. How do we build credibility in the company of skeptics and disinformers? Okay, wonderful question. And I promise you, I will get to that when I talk about the basics of lighting your lamp. And as you know, you know that I've got some kind of a, you know, a, a group of words that that means, but I, I will do that um, soon. Okay. Hey, no further questions. Back to you. So um, I'm going to introduce some of the content of this by going over the three the three myths and the three secrets that you need to, to know to get you wide-eyed with surprise and delight. And I know that sounds kind of, I know that kind of sounds very, perhaps even naive, but um, I hope that you'll see very quickly that, uh, that uh, I've got reasons to be saying that and I'm not exactly, totally naive but anyway absolutely i am i am not surprised if you if you are thinking that about me before i get into the deep dive i want to let you know that i've got a couple of bonuses for you at the end for those who stick around and one of them has got nothing directly to do with negotiating but it is all about kind of building your capacity to deal with difficult circumstances and challenges that solopreneurs face as we deal with the challenges of everyday business, with the difficulties of, of relationships. And sometimes it's even just the complexity of, of trying to figure out exactly what is the most, the best, the most strategic thing for us to be doing in each mo moment. And so this 20 minute miracle is a che checklist and it's a step-by-step -step process to how to build your resilience. And resiliency, is, again, is one of the things that underscores and underpins your capacity to be an effective leader of your life and to work with other people very well. So I've got that. Um, I've also got um, one where I'm going to invite a few people, I've just made some time Friday and next week to invite some of you to spend 20 minutes one-on-one, -on -one, no cost with me to look, to get some insight into your personal blocks about negotiating. Um, there, there's just a limited number, but I'll, I'll talk about, about that later. Um, and then I'll provide you with a, a link to a download of these slides. So, and I will update some of these slides tomorrow so that it's a little bit more, perhaps a little bit more accurate. But my favorite that I do ask of you is really to be fully here and, and Roger's already dealt with that. So a little bit about me. Um, I, for the last 20 years, I've worked for with international NGOs on peace and justice issues at the United Nations. Uh, Best-selling book, Change It Up, in United Nations Unlocked. I host a, a exceptional.tv, which is a, a podcast of its own. Um, in the past, I've run a fleet of 100 boats with for international youth leadership training program. I did that for 10 years. I've run um, a fleet of buses in New York City while restructuring because of the business, because it was failing. And I finally handed it off as a viable entity. It sold it off because I didn't want to remain a tour operator for the rest of my life. Um, I've worked in the Middle East on peace issues because I, I started working around the United Nations with an international women's organization. Oh, that was one of my, not the biggest fish that I caught what, during the time that I was um, running the program up, um, up in, out of Massachusetts. Um, I have 
since trained over 2000 international activists who operate effectively in the intergovernmental arena of the United Nations, I've developed the TQ leadership that I draw on for some of the materials that I, I show you. And I've, I utilize that to urge and push elements of the UN forward. Um, I, I was brought on, in fact, by the UNCIO to help with a small but strategic segment of their uh, digital transformation effort at the UN in 2017, being the chair of the Alliance of NGOs and Crime Prevention and Criminal Justice. I don't know whether the, the, <laughs> the closed captioning is going to be working, and I still represent an organization to the United Nations. So, so that's just a little bit of my background. Um, and yes, I'm a VR gamer. I already found that. But it was while I was at the UN that I hit my highs and my lows. Why I delved more deeply into, into what on earth was going on than what I learned in physics and my history and philosophy of science and when I did my Masters of Divinity, when I got my doctoral program. But this is where I pay attention. And, and since then, I've really sought to look beneath the surface, but of what and how to use this in practical and pragmatic ways. Again, I'm the daughter of a farmer. I like riding motorcycles and I pulled my motorcycle to pieces and I put it back together again. I like the practical stuff. It has to be useful. I guess I've always liked Apple because it's beautiful and it functions. I know that there's lots of arguments for all kinds of other stuff too, but that's a whole other conversation. So the real issue here is how can we use some of the knowledge that I'm about to get into to optimize those hidden drivers that otherwise undermine our best intentions because I've been in a situation where I worked for a number of years to pull together an international group. I, it was supported by so many who would put their effort, their money, their time, their days on the line to create a new entity at the international level. And I'm not going to go into all the details. The relevant point here is right at the time that that new international entity was about to be launched, some of the very people who had been the main stakeholders in the process pulled the plug. The night before it was going to be launched at an international conference, they decided, nope, we're not going to do it. I saw that as a profound failure of leadership. I've come to see that in that there is also a whole lot of other failures, if I want to call them that, of mine. Things I didn't see, tea leaves I was not reading, information right in front of my face that I did not pay attention to. Now, maybe I could never say that entity but it was devastating to me. And I dare say, after watching what happened at 9-11, I was in New York City, I saw a lot of that, I was there. I dealt with interreligious dynamics in the Middle East, the complexity of all of that in peace and justice and violent extremism. So I'll, I'll never know, but what I did come to see is how crucial it is to look below the surface, to look behind the person and to read what is going on or not just read and guess, but to draw that information out from them, from your team, from your partner, from your business partner, from your stakeholders, from those who are depending on you. Sometimes we can lose years because we don't find out enough what's right in front of our eyes. So my focus here is 
I mentioned all of that. Um, I'm going to skip through to uh, maybe, maybe the one thing that I do want to put here, and this is just another way of looking at essentially what I'm saying, the same kind of thing where we are together in this world right now. We are in a place where, let me share my screen, where our technology is growing at a rapid rate. But our human, social, emotional, our institutional evolution, our leadership track practices, how we function in our relationships are only still incrementally growing. We need to significantly up-level our capacity to lead in the midst of uncertainty and this gray area, this huge area that is, that is forming. I know this gray area is where cybersecurity um, are, uh, are having a, you know, more than a headache. That's where the cyber criminals hang out and are building their businesses in this gray space because the, the laws, the systems, the leadership has not been able to keep up with the pace of change. We experience that anxiety in our own lives. So we've got to get back to doing the things that connect us that make us more adaptive to what's going on in front of us and being better together. So we, we have that connect, it's out through our connection that we're able to be creative. And so that's, I'm, I'm emphasizing this and taking the time on this because behind these simple tools that I will give you to, to get you started is a, a world of importance of taking the time to connect deeply with the other, not just to get a yes, but to get an agreement. To get an agreement, we need to build that trust, like the question that came before. How do we do that? How do we do that when the other person or what's between us is a chasm? There is that gap. Sometimes it's like, sometimes maybe it's not a technology gap, but it, it's, it's a gap between mindsets and people. We still have to have ways to bridge those gaps. Karen, question for you. Please. This comes from Don Dahl in Nashville. I'm a realtor in Nashville, a very competitive market. My main job in negotiations feels like diffusing a situation and communication, but the negotiation feels so one-sided on the side of the one in power. How can we acknowledge power, not feel at the mercy of power and win the deal? Okay, so what I will do is I will use this um, question as a way to introduce some of the content that you can get when you download, when you download the, the um, slides. One of the best ways, and this is something that I learned for, actually from um, a hostage negotiator, not, I've used different systems and programs and ways of dealing with things in, um, in the United Nations to even get a lot of people in positions of power, and I would say that uh, member states and diplomats have a lot more power than a representative of, a, of an NGO. I'm just an, in, in their world, I'm a nobody. But to be able to move a whole process through to the point where I gathered a group of disparate member state representatives, handed them off to one particular mission that was willing to spearhead it to the point where it became a general assembly resolution. I said that in a few seconds, it took more than a few seconds to actually accomplish that, but there were very definitely, and there was very definitely in all of those relationships, a, an imbalance of power. So yes, when there is an imbalance of power, 
You don't have to try to fight them for their power. That is a losing battle. Deference throughout negotiations, when somebody feels that they are more important than you, or has a position of authority where you don't, or has the upper hand or just stakes that claim, that's okay. You have to know who you are. You don't have to fight them for your authority or value. But there are some very specific things that you can do. And that is where, um, and I, I think I've, I saw one person in here who, who, who's actually, thank you for being, for joining me this evening, who has gone through actually one of my programs and, and has tried this out for herself. Where you actually create a, what I call a gripe list or your laundry list of gripes that they have about you, what they think inside their head. Sometimes they'll say it out loud. Sometimes they won't. So for example, I'm, a, I'm an NGO. I'm coming to an ambassador. I know in his head, he's thinking, okay, so here's another, here's another one. What do they want? The only reason why she is here is she wants something from me. Okay, I'll do my duty. I'll stand here. I'll listen nicely for two seconds, but I know I'm going to be keeping my eyes open for the real, really important people that are going to be walking by um, that I really need to speak to. I just have to listen to her for long enough that I can move on. So in those situations, you know, you, you say out loud what you know they are thinking. Mr. Ambassador, I, I know, I, I understand that you would be thinking that I'm just going to be wasting your time, that I'm wanting something from you. that I really don't have anything to offer that could help you. Speak out loud what you know is in their head, what they, you pretty much know they are thinking about you. Now, I don't know your exact situation uh, as I've never been a realtor. Um, um, and yes, it's a very competitive market. Your, your job is to diffuse a situation. And in that saying those gripes out loud takes the wind out of their sails. If you've said out loud, and so I would encourage each of you before you go into a, what you know is gonna be a very difficult situation is sit down and write a list. Write a list of all of the things that you think are going to be, that person is going to be saying in their head about you. Write them down. Even practice saying them out loud because it's, it's kind of hard. Don't defend yourself. Just say, you must think that. You would normally think that, whatever it is that that, that is, but Say it out loud, do not defend your, don't, don't say, but I'm not like that. Don't add that piece. Just write out your gripe list, your laundry list of all, and write out as many as you can. Exhaust your list. And the minute you come in front of them, diffuse those, those negative, negative thoughts with your gripe list. Um, that's one of the ways to diffuse that. Now, um, beyond that, I, I, I will get to the lamp, but I want to jump back in and go into a little bit. I want to show you something about yourself so that you understand why what's going on underneath is, um, it's important for you to understand that I'm just behind the scenes going forward to um, the just finding my uh, 
the slide that I want to get to. Um, maybe I'll just I'll just reconvene with my uh, talk right here. So it's just, I guess, looking at the, the myths, and I'll get very quickly to the deep, the underlying stuff. But just a reminder that we spend up to 40% of our day trying to influence peers, um, our teams, our families, and stakeholders. Um, I want to remind you that um, an important thing an important thing for you to think about is number one, as I said before, to know ourselves. And so part of what I encourage is to understand who you are, to notice what's going on in your life, in your feelings, to learn how to um, identify and label your own feelings, because you're going to need to learn how to identify and label other people's feelings. And there's a reason for doing this. This is part of the LAMP process. Um, a piece that's tied in with understanding who you are and who you understand your counterpart is, is using the platinum rule. And that is not the golden rule, it's treat others the way they want to be treated. So that's why if you've got these three basic kinds, your um, analytical personality, they don't want to be met by an assertive, they will back off, that's not a good match. So if you're working with a, an analytical person, you can go ahead and give be analytical back to them or build your relationship back to them. Uh, um, accommodator and accommodator are not good together. They'll have a nice meeting, but won't get any, anything done. Uh, an assertive and an assertive, that's a recipe for, um, for a mistake, for problems. So part of that is treating others the way they want to be treated and understanding the three different personality types the three fundamental personality types when you're in your default mode. And that I don't have the time to go into how to ascertain that right here, but you, there's a bare metaphor for that one. Um, <clears throat> this is what I wanted to get to is that this is the human element that is always at play and that's always going on. Each one of us, we have kind of like three brains. There's almost like three functions to who I am. And that's my survival component. That's the piece that I call it the lizard brain, just because it's the reptilian complex rather than calling it the snake brain or something else. Um, so when we're acting very, when we are reacting to what's going on, we are acting from our lizard brain. It's always there, kind of hidden in the bushes, in our, our amygdala and whatever else. Uh, when we are, when someone attacks us, our we our amygdala is hijacked, and that that amygdala hijack hijacks all of us. When those chemicals are flowing through our body, and when our during that amygdala hijack. Uh, quite literally, our, our blood drains from our brain, goes to our arms and our legs so that we can be ready for fight and flight. We are less smart. And that's not something we choose. It's something that happens as a reaction to our circumstances. Yes, we can get feedback. Yes, we can adapt. Yes, we can adjust. But we have to know that this is a fundamental piece of who we are. Another one is that we have um, our limbic brain, our social emotional part, that is our neo-mammalian complex. We can't help but want to be in relationship. We respond to peer pressure. 
we see more people gathered outside that restaurant and so want to go to that restaurant. We have fashion, we have memes, we have all of these things because part of our very functioning that is pre-rational, that is below the surface and part of, of our fast nature, and that's the social emotional side. So relationships are important to us. It's a part of who we are as human beings. So we've got these two parts and then we've got another part. Yep, the one that we mostly think through, the strategic, the logic, language-based, language our executive brains, the piece that we tend to assume is who we are. But the reality a lot of the time is that we are more like, and sorry, that one, that one I'm just going to move on to this image. Um, I didn't realize I had that piece in there. Um, Daniel Kahneman, who is a, you know, a, a rather famous economist, but also he looked at the psychology of human beings as well, um, refers to the fast system or system one and system two to fast and slow thinking. So our logical brains, our language are part of the slow rational component that we think through and tend to think is the world. The fast system is always going on below the surface, but we're not paying enough attention to this. This is the part that we really need to pay attention to and therefore um, is what I want to um, speak to now. And that's the part of building trust, building our competence in the, those areas and building happy clients. And um, so again, good negotiations don't do any of those things. So this is where- Karen, we, can you take a question before you move into us. this part? Can Sorry, you I beg your pardon? A, can you take a question before you move into this part? I certainly can. This question is from Miriam. How do you generate momentum and make it safe to reveal the real stakes? To make it stick to reveal the real stakes? <clears throat> Again, um, by using essentially what I'm about to give you the doorway openers for, and that's lamp. And that is by labeling, accepting and ensuring, and assuring, mirroring, and paraphrasing. So lighting your lamp is all about being quiet and listening deeply. Yes, you have to talk. Yes, you have to get things going. But when you're in, if you're trying to find out what are the real stakes of a negotiation, what is what does the person really want? Or you hear them say, my goal here is to um, create a win-win situation. Well, but what does that mean? So one of the ways you can respond to that is with a mirror. Win-win, the person might say, I want, I want to create a win-win. So all you have to do is say win-win with an inflection up. You mirror what they say. Try it sometime. Just because it sounds simple doesn't make it always easy to do and doesn't make it um, not worth the doing. Let me just pull, pull this. Sorry, I'd forgotten that I'd taken it out. Label, lamp, light your lamp is to label, accept and assure, mirror and paraphrase. You don't necessarily do these step one, step two, step three, step four. These are a combination of, th of things that you do in that conversation because basically what you are doing here is building empathy. In order to reach an agreement, the other, your counterpart, needs to know you have heard them. They need to feel 
not just to hear the words, they need to feel and know in their lizard brain and in their social emotional part of who they are, their gut, so to speak, that you have heard them. How do, you, how do they know that you've heard them? When you mirror something they've said, when you, if you say, when they, if perhaps if they said, um, so I'm, I, you know, I, I want this to be a win-win relationship. You can say, it sounds to me like you value contribution from both parties for this. That is a label on what, a label, in a sense, it's a label of their endeavor, a label of their value, a label of what they are wanting. What that does to them is it helps them feel heard. How many of you have ever been in a conversation with somebody and they're on their cell phone? Or you can see behind their eyes, they're trying to think about what they're about to say next. They're not listening to you. On the flip side, have you ever had a relationship, been in a conversation with somebody where you decided you were just going to really listen? And at the end of the conversation, they get up and say, you, you, actually, you might not have even said hardly anything other than introduce yourself. And they've said, well, that was a wonderful conversation. Because they felt heard. Human beings have a fundamental need. It's like some people call it the oxygen or in their life to be seen and to be heard. When we are not seen, when we are not heard, we get desperate. It's like, ah, ah. Have you ever spoken to your spouse and you feel like they're not hearing you? Anybody? Am I the only one? <laughs> and sometimes we're not hearing them. Sometimes they're not hearing us. So how to step into that moment and bring it back? Take a breath. Realize that for this conversation to go somewhere meaningful, and productive and to get it to a point where it can be creative and collaborative to solve the real problem that brought you together in the first place, it's really important to take the time to hear, to listen, and to show them your hearing, to be able to identify their emotions behind what they're saying, and even say back, it sounds to me like you don't believe that I heard you. You didn't feel heard. You're angry that, that I skipped on so quickly and you're disappointed. If you can start to label all the different emotions, even labeling different emotions has its own power because it, each one of those emotions is opening a door to a solution that you can follow. I can't get into all the details, but the more you can see, notice, and identify even the emotions in the other and in yourself, the better you're going to be able to build that genuine rapport and trust between you. Sometimes the most desperate people are just desperate to be heard. Sometimes the most aggressive negotiators are so because they don't feel respected and appreciated. And then the P, the paraphrase, 
is all about being able to say in your words as well as in theirs, because sometimes turning it around and giving it your perspective on what they're saying is useful to the other. You may wonder what this has got to do with negotiating. But if you try to skip to the end and make a deal and consummate the marriage before you've even wooed the lady, the chances are that things are not going to go well. Just because you get to your deal and articulating the deal does not mean you'll have profound levels of agreement and commitment. And good negotiations are worth their weight in gold because they bring you to that point. You can diffuse the negativity through the list that I gave, the, your laundry list that I gave you, that I mentioned before. You can begin to build that trust and rapport in profound ways. And I don't have time to go here into the reasons why that is, it can be so transformative. And why does it need to be transformative? Because what we need to be doing now is not just doing more of what we've done in the past. We need to be engaged in genuine, collaborative, creative relationships. And that takes, it takes time and it's worth the time to build with, start building with your lamp. That's just the beginning. Now, I know that I'm horrible at keeping on time and I'm going to skip to the end and at least let you know how. Um, um, oh, there's so much more. I, I'm going to have to invite you over to, I've got a three day coming, but I don't have, I don't have that here. But um, I'm going to go to the end of my, um, to where I've, I'm just going to jump to my gifts to you and then invite you to say, hey, at least, you know, send me your email or something and I'll put you on a list and invite you to some other, uh, other trainings and things like that. If that's, if any of this is useful to you or interesting, uh, but I promised that I would give you a, a three gifts and he, these are the options and I can, uh, one is just, um, and that way I can get your email. If you like that, you have to go in there and give me your email. You know the deal, the routine. <clears throat> but the TQ algorithm goes into um, just a stepwise process for building your resiliency. Because in all of this, what I'm really encouraging you to do is to build your emotional intelligence, to build your capacity to handle your inner life, your inner world, so that you can be a guide and a strength for others as well. When you learn the, 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 this approach to negotiating, it's really an approach to guiding and leading and working with other people. But a key part of that is building your own emotional intelligence, your resiliency your capacity to deal with difficulty, with traumatic events, to, to handle complexity, and yet to keep yourself on track and online and moving forward, even when it's difficult. And this will help you do that. And um, at some stage uh, in a couple of months, I'm going to have a live training on, on as part of a larger thing on that. And it's all, you can just get access to it. It's, it's, Part of it is I, uh, I've worked so many years in this sphere. I'm so um, serious about encouraging people to really dig into and unleash your own real potential. Those two thirds that I know most people are not tapping already. The one thing that is a limited time because I've just made it because I have limited time uh, and I've made time on Friday and next week. If any of you want to get on with me for 20 minutes, it's a 20 minute one on one where we where we can explore um, what are some of the things that are holding you back from being a good negotiator. 
use specifically. We will look at some of those specific things. And then after that, I will send you very quickly some, just a couple of little, what I call mini maps for you to practice to help build your resilience, your, your, your negotiation skills. So you can get that there either. Uh, again, you can get a screenshot or um, follow the, I think uh, Roger is putting it in, dropping those links in the chat for you. And the third one is the, you can download these slides. So there's a whole lot more than what I've gone over here. Um, a lot of the slides, just so you know, a lot of the slides were, were put in there as a way for me to remember what I was going to say to you guys, <laughs> as much as it was bullet points for you. So you can sift through what you see. So that's just a summary of what I have. Boom, boom, boom. Um, again, I continue to work with those people who are activists and change makers. That's my passion. They're my people. I would love to invite you to take you know, if I can be of any help and support or mentor you in any ways, mentors have been critical to me in my life and my own development. We are social beings, we need one another um, and we benefit and grow from one another. Um, I've gone way overboard and I'll close that out <laughs> there uh, and hand it off back to you, Roger. Great. Thank you very much, Karen. The, the whole challenge of communication between human beings is monstrous. And uh, you have uh, spotlighted the uh, behind the scenes. What are they really thinking? Uh, which is uh, great. And, and, uh, and often we take it at face value. Uh, and you're in, you've encouraged us to go deeper. And that's a powerful message. Uh, thank you on behalf of EIN's 82,000 members uh, for sharing this important message with us.